सह चंद्रमसे This is uh, Lynn Budis, and I'm uh, leading my very first ACFA webinar. Uh, this is our uh, once a month uh, free webinar where we uh, have an open uh, discussion, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently than uh, Charlotte has done in the past. And uh, first of all, I'm going to show my screen and uh, you, should see, uh, you should see Ganesh here. Do you see Ganesh? And oh, we'll start with a chant. Om Gam Ganapatiye Namaha. Om Gam Ganapatiye Namaha. Om Gam Ganapatiye Namaha. Okay, so now uh, the topic of the day from ACFA, the American College of Vedic Astrology, as I'm presenting a little bit about the moon and how we look at it in a in a chart. And so I'm going to put up. Uh, I'm going to put up a chart of a famous Hollywood actor whose moon is just amazing and so we're looking at the moon today. So, um, so please uh, if uh, uh, Bhagya, please uh, send me a little text if you can see uh, if you can see two charts on my screen. Lynn, give me one second. I am changing the setting. Then you can show. Okay. Okay. you can share now okay so friends you should be able to see uh, a birth a astrology chart on my screen and the one I picked today is Jeff Bridges who is a, a well-known Hollywood actor uh, he was born in 1949 and the reason I picked this chart is because uh, of the moon. And in Vedic astrology, if you are new to this compared to Western astrology, the moon is of tremendous importance. And in fact, if, you, uh, if, if a Vedic astrologer asks your sign, what they mean is your moon sign usually, uh, and especially the nakshatra or the, uh, the, uh, the uh, lunar asterism, in which your moon was when you were born. So uh, it would be really, really, really hard to find many people who have the moon in such a wonderful condition. And, you know, we spend a lot of time in, uh, in Vedic astrology when we do readings of helping people muddle through uh, the, uh, the uh, ordinary sorts of condition of the moon. But once in a while, it's just nice to see that really beautiful, bright moon uh, and in its all its glory. So I'm presenting this chart. And <clears throat> why do we look at the moon? Uh, well, the, uh, the sun gives us the give, gives us the the life force. We know that the rising sign gives us the uh, the what is coming and become, becoming active in an incarnation but the moon is the substance of the body we're in and it's the our our mind in the sense of the bigger mind not just the monkey mind of mercury uh, but our mind of um of compassion of common sense our body our fluids uh how we connect with the people around us uh we sure look at the moon if we're getting married all those things. So here is Jeff, and Jeff was born into a prominent Hollywood family, and he was blessed with two great parents. Uh, he was, his father was a television uh, star who had the 
best-selling series called Sea Hunt, which was uh, a nature documentary. His mother was also an accomplished actress and a, a attended mom. And as a child, he and his brother would uh, be on the boat sometimes in Sea Hunt as guest stars. But really, he had a sheltered existence and uh, had a good upbringing and went on to have his own career. And oddly enough, unlike the typical Hollywood star, he, he found his love, got married, and has stayed married all these years, raised a family, kept his life pretty private. So here is what an exalted, wonderful moon looks like. And so now, if you would mind, look at these two squares, whichever of the two you're comfortable with. It's the, the left one is the North Indian style with the rising sign at the top. Five means Leo. And to the right, you'll see M-O, light blue. That's the moon. Two means Taurus, moon in Taurus in the 10th house. Now, if you go to the other South Indian chart, you will again see the rising sign, but here the rising sign is always, you know, the sign, the zodiac signs are always in the same place. So the rising sign on the right, AS, uh, that is Leo, always in that spot, and the moon counting around one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, is in the tenth house and that is the place of Taurus. Okay, so it's the same chart, looks different, whichever one you like to look at, most of us have a preference. So here we have the moon, and number one, the moon is in the 10th house, the house of fame, of prominence, the career. Here's a guy, as I say, he came into a family that was famous for sea hunt, uh, he is, uh, the moon has these connections with the ocean. It's in Taurus, and Taurus is our, is the exalted sign, the favorite sign of the moon. Uh, there's this famous story uh, of Rohini, uh, who was the favored wife of, of uh, Soma the moon. And in this particular story, the moon had 27 wives, which represent the nakshatras. And the uh, uh, he was supposed to go visit one wife her every night, but he really loved Rohini, the uh, the favorite. And it's he. This ended up becoming a problem. The other wives were jealous. They went to their father. He, they complained and uh, he was punished and made to waste away, but uh, the mitigation was that he would die and be reborn in every lunar cycle. But it still remains that his very favorite place to be is Rohini in the middle of Taurus. And that is the where there's a the key part of the constellation Orion and the beautiful, beautiful star Betelgeuse, which is uh, red, and it's thought of as the red wagon. And of course, Taurus, the zodiac symbol, has to do with uh, the earth, with fertility, with that, you know, the maximum springtime of uh, uh, where where we incarnate, where we, um, you know, do do those things that uh, make uh, make things grow. And uh, we we cook, we plant, we cook, we we eat, we procreate, we have have a good time together. Uh, so to have that moon in not just Taurus, but Rohini, uh, it's, it's a very positive one, especially uh, now we're gonna look at how does it influenced? Well, number one, it's a full moon. You'll notice opposite sun, opposite sign, sun and Scorpio moon in Taurus. Over here we have sun in Scorpio, moon in Taurus. Full moon is the very best way to have your moon. It's the most powerful at that time. Uh, as, as we know, uh, you know, you don't have to be an astrologer to like the full moon. And then in addition, if you'll notice that degree symbol, 1616. Okay, that means it is in the middle of the 30 degrees of Taurus 
And if we divide the sine of 30 degrees into nine parts, they're called navamsha, which means nine, division of nine, and it's in the uh, middle one of those, which means that if we go into the navamsha divisional chart, which I'm not going to show, it would be in the same sign in the navamsha chart. It's what's called vargodama, another wonderful uh, thing that increases its strength. And because it's exalted in in uh, Taurus, it's also exalted in the Navamsha, so it ends up being wonderful there. And I will just say that um, that if we were looking at that chart, the moon is in the seventh house of the Navamsha, which uh, it looks as though it uh, gives some blessing to his marriage. So now I'm just going to take a quick look at some of those other things we look at to uh, determine if the moon is uh, how the moon's going to play out. And one of those is what are the relations with the other planets? Okay, so we will notice that the sign ruler of Taurus, so the moon's lord, is Venus. Venus rules Taurus. Now, the pink one over here, Venus, is the sixth house. It's maybe not the greatest, but it's Capricorn. But look, it's with Jupiter, which is benefic. Uh, so it's helped by that. Then we see Jupiter. Jupiter is in a trine aspect. It's in the Earth sign. It makes its five signs away from Capricorn to Taurus. That's what we call a special aspect. Jupiter really helps here. So even though Jupiter and Venus are in the sixth house, they do wonderful things for the moon. Then we have Mercury, which is the other benefic, and uh, it's again in a uh, opposite the moon in an aspect. Uh, it uh, everything kind of uh, brings good things to the moon. Now we have a couple other things that present a bit of a more of a problem. Rising sign is Leo, and Saturn is in the rising sign and Mars Saturn together in Leo we have a big body and uh thing about Jeff Bridges is he really was a big guy I mean if you see him in his movies the big beloved Lebowski if you see him in Starman and many others you'll see he's uh you know he was a football player in high school he's big and he you know had moderate athletic ability, but we have Saturn making a special aspect to the tenth house. So that's like not all is all just hunky dory. I mean, he had you know he uh, for Jeff the big personal challenge was to decide whether he really wanted that uh, movie career, and he felt like he needed to go out and make a name for himself and not just ride on the uh, family coattails. So. He uh, spent quite a bit of time in the um, in in the Coast Guard as National Guard and uh, worked his way up to uh, to a rank in the Coast Guard. Uh, went to acting school and just dedicated himself to making himself a very good actor. Uh, he was famous for how well he could just take on all sorts of characters. And then we'll notice that Mars. Yeah, even though it doesn't make an aspect to to the tenth house moon, it makes an aspect to the fourth house, which of course the fourth house has to do with the moon, and so we have this really nice connection with a lot of we got five planets in the what we call the Kendras, the angles. So yes, this is a prominent life. Now one other thing I'll mention, which is we have this wonderful thing in uh, in. Vedic astrology, which you can study at ACVA, is the dashas, and I'm not going to show that on the uh, screen, but what we get is we get uh, the moon at the start of his life in Rohini, which is ruled by the moon. So his very first dasha, his first period of life was under the moon, and he had, you know, a, as I say, a really wonderful mother who really devoted herself and uh, provided the right balance. His mother and father provided a good balance of uh, of structure and nurturing, and so he had this really great start of you know being born in a in a really good place in time. But 
The fact is he ran with it. So anyway, I'm going to, uh, at this point, I want to ask a question. And what I'm going to do is our participants out there, if I want to ask you uh, to just kind of take a poll, first of all, uh, and write in the chat, uh, you know, beginning, uh, as in you know very little about astrology, uh, uh, category two, student, and third is advanced. So how many of you are beginning a student or advanced? Uh, go ahead and enter that in the um, in the chat and then Bhagya will report on that to me. And then I, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the uh, things that um, uh, that are uh, I'm going to switch back and just show uh, talk now uh, with uh, with this chart with uh, Jeff Bridges. So I'm just going to mention two movies while you're um, uh, entering in the chat. There is uh, the one that caught my attention early on was Starman in the 80s. And uh, my husband just adores that movie. We saw it recently and it's still a heck of a lot of fun. Um, many of you have heard of the story of the avatars of Vishnu and how the Grahas, each of them represent one of the avatars. There are ways that, uh, that Lord Vishnu came into physical existence to uh, deal with a situation. Well, this would be the 1980s movie Hollywood version of an avatar, Starman, uh, trying to figure out what's going on on Earth. Uh, uh, a pro uh, finds this young widow and finds uh, finds a DNA sample, some hair and photos, and uh, makes himself into a double, and uh, proceeds to you know totally disrupt her life. They fall in love. They spend three days with the Madcap Adventure, trying to get him back to his um, ra spaceship rendezvous, and uh, the, uh, uh, he leaves her. A, leaves her uh, pregnant. So that's Starman. And then we have at the other end of the spectrum at the near the in the more recent career as a mid uh, late middle age, the big Lebowski who where he plays a, a character who's a layabout, um, you know, a hippie surfer on the beach who does as little as possible and just, you know, is is imperturbable who uh, what, you know, all sorts of crazy situations descend and he, he does not get out of balance. He's, he's, he's there. He's, he's, he's like the, uh, like the, the Malibu Buddha or whatever. Um, and with, but nonetheless, with lots of humor and uh, plenty of, uh, plenty of slapstick and plenty of Hollywood. So, as I say, just a, a real range of characters. He was uh, someone who's played alongside famous actors, Clint Eastwood, all sorts of people enjoy, have enjoyed working with him. So um, Bhagya, do we have, um, do we have a response from our, um, from our people here? Yes, we do. Um, we have many students. We also have advanced um, experienced people and we have many students here. Yes, we, we everybody respond to it. All right. Well, I appreciate it. And now I want to kind of to open up. This is a chance, number one, uh, with questions about the moon. We're not taking questions about individual charts, but this is a good time to open for discussion about how we treat the moon in a Vedic chart, uh, if there are questions about this chart. And also, if you have uh, questions, if you're not enrolled in ACFA and have questions and want to know uh, about our program, this is also a time you can ask. <coughs> so I'll say a little bit while we're waiting for questions and um, uh, I recently joined the faculty and the uh, leadership team of ACFA, but I took the ACFA program myself in 2006 to 2009, uh, level one and level two. So um, those, I remember fondly my school years, you might say, I was already a uh, experienced Western astrologer, but 
um, I fell down the rabbit hole and just um, found Vedic astrology astounding. So now I'm now it's my turn to give back. Can I read the questions for you, Lynn? Yeah, yes, go ahead and uh, read the first question. Okay. Um, is it a problem here that the moon doesn't have any planets in the second to 12th houses from the moon? That's an excellent question because, of course, one of the things we learn about in uh, when we study the yogas in, uh, in, uh, in Vedic astrology is there's a very uh, important yoga called Kama Druma Yoga, in which the moon is all alone. It, uh, or, well, it's that there's nothing, uh, no grahas or sun nearby. Uh, uh, now, that would be a problem except for two things. Number one, that, well, three. Number one, the full moon, it's in a full aspect with the sun. Number two, it's in a full aspect with Mercury. And number three, it's receiving a one-way uh, trine aspect from Jupiter. So in those ways, it's very well connected to the rest of the chart. And so, no, this is not the, not the lonely moon. We do see the lonely moon. We do see Kama Druma Yoga uh, fairly frequently and the... Uh, uh, for instance, one personal chart uh, I can relate to someone in my family who was, has came and drew my moon uh, with moon with Rahu. And the only aspect is from Mercury, which is with Ketu. Uh, so, yes, he was an only child and his mother had difficulty, um, nearly died after he was born and chose not to have any more children because she wanted to raise him. And he did well, but, you know. He has the only, he is the only child and there's a different consciousness when you, uh, when you have that. Next question. Yes, the second question, influence of Saturn with full moon in fifth. Okay, influence of Saturn with full moon in the fifth. So when we have the full moon in the fifth, uh, you've got, uh, well, the, there are several meanings of the fifth. We've got the punya, punya karma, the good karma that we might have come into this life with from, from past. Uh, we often have a really good ability to learn things if it's a full moon. We've got uh, 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 an interest in children, an interest in creativity, in whatever sign or uh, nakshatra that moon is in. But... If Saturn is influencing it, there's also a sense of limitation, okay? If Saturn is conjunct the moon, uh, the person's always going to feel that they're not, in some way they may not be good enough. If the moon is in uh, coming from the 11th, the opposite house, uh, there may be this feeling that you can't seem to get ahead, that uh, you're um maybe not able to enjoy what you you know what your children or what it is you want to get done if the moon is in the third house making a one-way aspect there may be problems coming related to the siblings or with uh expressing oneself um, if uh, the moon is in the eighth there may be problems related to uh to debts to um to chronic illness that impair the ability to enjoy all those fifth house things. Okay, we have a few more questions. Is a kem Kemaduruma is a yoga? Yes, yoga means a combination. Now, we also know about yoga where, where you do cobra pose where you meditate where you that's that's the practice of yoga but within astrology we have used the same word uh yuga to mean combination so what we get just kind of patterns and we see combinations so for instance in this chart um, i'm going to switch the screen again 
and we see the um, we see one combination, a very important one. If you look, the Sun and Mercury, the uh, on the left hand side in the North Indian chart, and down in the uh, bottom in the right hand one, they're together and they're in the same sign. That's a pretty common one. It's called Buddha Aditya Yoga. That means Buddha, Mercury combined with the star, the sun, together. And uh, it's pretty common. I mean, it shows up uh, in, in quite a few charts, but when it's there combined with other things, you get what's called uh, a little boost for the mental ability. Uh, all other things being equal, this person will be um, above average intelligence. If it's in a very prominent spot, they may be very bright indeed. Any more questions? Um, that's what I checked and it looks like no more questions. All right, well. I'll read it later on if there's anything. Um, right now we are good to go. Okay, so uh, the um, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to put up a different shot here, and excuse me here. This is only the um, this is only the uh, no, the North Indian version of this, but I'm going to kind of get you a picture of the dashas in the bottom right. And remember, I told you how the moon uh, was in, he was born in the moon Dasha. He was born in 1949, halfway through the moon period, which lasts 10 years. And then we'll just take a little run through here. His life, he, uh, uh, he started his Mars Dasha in childhood. And uh, he, when his father was away, uh, doing uh, doing his acting and directing things. Uh, he was attending a private school and he had a big brother who made sure, who, who was his sports coach and supervisor, made sure that he got to and from practices. Uh, and uh, he had, uh, yeah, was able to develop a, some strength there. And you'll notice that his Mars, is in the first house in the Lugna, okay? And then in Leo, and Mars is a friend in Leo and uh, he's uh, competitive, uh, just got to enjoy doing those little boy things. And Mars is the ruler of two important houses. It's a good, for Leo rising, Mars is a great planet. It's a yoga karaka, uh, meaning it rules two favorable houses, the fourth house, Scorpio, and the 10th house, Aries. So this is, a, this is a, you know, a happy thing for development. And then we get to the next one, Rahu, 1962 to 1980. And Rahu's more complicated. And at that stage, that was his teenage years and early adult years. Uh, and as I say, he had a pretty, a conventional upbringing, but then he, instead of going to college, he joined the National Guard, though of course that was the the 60s, uh, and one either went to college or went got drafted or enlisted. So he enlisted in the Coast Guard. He um, already knew about boats. Uh, he continued to serve in the Coast Guard for a number of years beyond uh, what he what was strictly necessary. And he used that money to pay for his own acting school. He went to acting school in New York and then began to work at getting, getting roles. When we get to 1980, that's when it was pretty, you know, you'll notice that Jupiter is in the sixth house, but it rules the, um, it rules the ninth house, it rules, I mean, it rules Sagittarius, the fifth house, as well as the eighth house. And it was in those years that he, he really started making, you know, he really had made a name for himself. He was on the making Starman, which was made on location in Montana and uh, the surrounding High Plains Rockies and the Southwest. And one of, 
there's a story in Starman where uh, featuring uh, featuring uh, a uh, the sort of uh, the sort of place one stops to get gas and eat out there in the out there in the high plains and um, that was exactly the setting that he met his future wife as she was from North Dakota and she was a waitress in that restaurant and that was during after a few years she said she was either getting married or packing up and going home to North Dakota they got married they had three kids and you know then he went through his Saturn Dasha Saturn is rising sign and rules six and seventh and now he's in Mercury Dasha and this is more of an issue um, just so you know, he was found to have lymphoma last year, and they, uh, you'll notice that Mercury rules his 11th house as well as the second house. And you'll notice Mercury is therefore Lord of the second, and the second and seventh houses are called the Makara houses, uh, which sometimes if everything else comes together, you may end your life when they're active. Uh, but he's apparently responding well to treatment. So that's uh, that's uh, just a little bit more about the dashas. And I want to see if we have any more uh, more questions. Yes, we do. Um, the first question: Can you say more about the different aspect of mind controlled by Mercury and the Moon? Yes. So the uh, let's start by looking at where the the chakras that they're related to and the elements and so forth. So very, very important when you look at, if you've studied yoga, you're aware of the thousand petal locatus chakra that's our, above our the, our head, uh, those, those lovely pictures of Lord Shiva with the moon, the crescent moon on his head. And uh, the moon is seen as that, channel it's uh we have in the body two nadis the solar and lunar up and down and it's one of those two and it's also related to the left eye uh in uh in in yoga and meditation and uh the luminary sun and moon are seen as those two sides of consciousness so the moon is just extremely elemental there and then we get to Mercury, which is more uh, more in the application end of things. Mercury is related to the throat chakra. It's related to to verbal expression, to logic, to making things add up, and uh, uh, it's related to its its ruling signs. It's got this connection to Gemini, which is an air sign, Mercury, which is an earth sign. So it's the verbal expression in Gemini and the um, practical detail application uh, in uh, in Virgo. So what I like to tell people is that uh, if you are raised in a Western culture, that we're raised with uh, a kind of a stunted, limited idea of what mind is. Because there's also the Jupiter part of mind, Jupiter the guru the the dharma the higher teachings the um the traditions that uh, that we can tap into and all of those have something to do with mind and uh, so one of the things i like about learning vedic astrology is it enlarges your vocabulary and ways to think about people because for instance we all know people who may be not terribly doing terribly well in the mercury part of mind i'm thinking of people like who have mercury in pisces where they have trouble keeping track of details with their attention their you know whatever and yet they have this just amazing wisdom because of that connection with jupiter pisces of you know whatever and you have people who may be quite accomplished uh, with a very well-developed mercury and you know quite high iq and very um very logical, very verbal, very organized, and yet they're on an emotion level, they're a mess. And they don't get very far. Uh, we, you know, I've presented here a person who had just an extremely well-developed, balanced moon. But once you start looking at charts of people you know, uh, we all know people who have to deal with uh, afflicted moon and how it affects their 
their thinking. Uh, and we, we think uh, there's a part of us thinks we are all logical, but in reality, we're very, um, we're very lunar. We have very, very emotional ground under all that. Okay, we have another question. Can you yeah. expand on moon conjuncting uh, Ketu? Okay, so uh, to begin with, remember what are Rahu and Ketu? They are the spots in the sky that show us where the eclipses will happen. And that changes from year to year. It rotates backwards compared to everything else, the, um, the uh, eclipse cycle. So if both sun and moon are lined up along Rahu K2, it's eclipse time. Okay, being born into an eclipse is a whole other issue, but right now I'm just looking at moon K2. If you have one half of that, they'll, uh, the, the emotions, the intuition is going to be the, the side that wants to um, let go of things, that wants to uh, leave the, leave cares behind them, who wants to expand consciousness, um, will be really um, increased, a very creative uh, person who whose instincts are maybe more toward inspiration, uh, artist, uh, um, uh, uh, person, you know, the person who sees things, and uh, sees things other people don't see. Uh, but it's one that uh, is um, things having to do with K2 and Moksha are a challenge in uh, Western society. Uh, we, um, and so this is a person who uh, uh, has got to find a different path on the practical level in life because, um, you know, they probably aren't going to want to just be in a boardroom and be an accountant or, you know, whatever, they've got to have that connection with inspiration, with spirituality, and they'll find it somehow, whether it's um, in a positive way or through addiction or, um, you know, or uh, some sort of loss experience. Okay, the next question. Can you elaborate on the aspect of Saturn to moon and meaning of difficulty? Okay, so with difficulty, See, the, the, the moon wants to nurture, wants to, wants to lubricate, saturate, nur, uh, grow, um, to, to, uh, to connect. And Saturn, let's, let's remember, where is Saturn? Saturn is clear out at the end of what we can see from planets. And it is very slow. It takes 29 years to go around the, the sky and it's called the lame one because it goes so slow. It spends two and a half years in every sign, whereas the moon, two and a half days. Okay, so just multi do the numbers and you'll see that Saturn is 365 times slower than the moon. That's really slow. And uh, Saturn represents, you know, if, if the moon is, is, I feel I can, I, you know, whatever the Saturn says can't. Saturn says, this is, this is the boundary. This is it. Time marches on. Um, you know, can't do everything in this lifetime. Um, and so it can represent loss, but it also on the positive side will represent the structure of things. So, we, you know, we come into a life, we've got, you know, a, a long lifespan may have three times Saturn goes around the sun while we're alive. And uh, you get to get to one of those changeover periods and Saturn says, okay, that deal's over, moving on to the next thing. That's a plus because otherwise would we, would we grow? Maybe not. Maybe we would just stay stuck in our patterns. On the downside, Saturn in reality will um, can create, uh, especially if it's really, really afflicting the moon, can create a tendency to depression of a feeling of can't is just overwhelming. Uh, so uh, these are these are the people that seem to always seem to be, have more troubles come their way, seem to have to struggle to keep a positive outlook. 
uh, who um, need to work with their thinking about how can they how can they see things positive. Uh, a uh, good thing is if a person has worked those things out may be uh, able to um, able to accomplish quite a lot because they then have the power of Saturn. Okay, one more question. Could you talk about Moon and Venus in the ninth in Libra? Okay, so um, we've got uh first of all i'm going to treat uh moon and venus if they're together that means that the moon that you know venus is never more than two signs away from the sun okay the that's just the way venus is so uh the if the moon is close to the sun it's not a full moon it's a crescent moon or a new moon okay so it's not as strong and it's uh, uh it's going to the, the dark moon gives us a little bit more of those sort of moodiness um you know unstable emotion type type manifestations of the moon it, um as and the moon and venus uh will you know they 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 coexist they can coexist but they're they're often not comf comfortable in each other's shadow very much like the the uh, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law relationship that you know they both represent something very important in a family uh, but uh, if they are living under the same household which they are if they're together like that symbolically um, it is not always easy because of, uh, they they have different agendas. So ninth house, um, and you said Libra, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So Venus being in Libra is in its own sign, and the uh, Moon uh, for a would. Uh, is the would be in the chart would be the fifth house would be cancer so it's the ruler of the fifth house and no sixth house and it's in the ninth house so it, uh, it the, venus is definitely the more positive of the two planets the two of them together though uh will be uh wanting to express themselves in some way related to libra of the arts of balance of getting along and, and uh, then we don't know about what the Sun and Mercury are doing, but we know they won't be far away if uh, if if they're say in Virgo, then we've got Mercury in Virgo, Venus in Libra. There's you know some some coordination. If they're uh, in the same sign, then that's an even more powerful combination of Mercury, Venus, Moon together. Uh, in any case, there's going to be of interest in ninth house matters and particularly with liberal arts with arts uh, uh possibly uh being able to um uh, being able to uh do some do some things with higher education and travel and by higher education i mean uh beyond what's the typical for your background so um I live in a in a part of the country where not where few people go to college, and so if I see a prominent ninth house, I want to say, okay, this is the person who went beyond high school that actually got that college degree. Whereas if the norm is college degree, the postgraduate degree, if uh, you know the the you know the travel, the going to different different horizons, uh, wanting to study more, so that combination of moon venus uh will have quite a sensitivity to wanting to connect with learning with wider horizons will not be content with just being in the house okay we have another question how can we tell from looking at a chart whether an eclipse was happening at birth okay very good question so 
let's take, I'm going to switch the screen and show you a chart again. Okay, so, um, so here is Jeff Bridges' chart, which does not have an eclipse, but let's look at Rahu and K2, the, the brown and the purple. You noticed how they're opposite, okay? Now, the uh, when, now suppose that we're gonna move this ahead to when there is an eclipse. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and imagine four months from now, January, February, March, April, uh, when, this, when the sun is in Pisces, it's with Rahu. Okay, now, when there's a full moon, Suppose that the moon has moved forward in that month and is now in with Ketu in Virgo. Pisces, Virgo, they have to be within about nine degrees for an actual eclipse to happen. And of course, every eclipse is different. I like to go to, uh, I, you know, at this point, uh, my reference guide usually is to uh, go to a calendar or go to NASA and find out where is this eclipse visible in the Earth at, on this particular day. Um, and, you know, sometimes some eclipses are really, really close and they go right overhead and you have something, you know, and for a full moon, you have what's called lunar eclipse where the moon disappears behind the shadow of the sun and you see that tawny red color you associate with Rahu. Um, and then on the other hand, if it's the new moon, suppose both sun and moon are close to uh, close to um, K2, then, then you would get a solar eclipse where the shadow of the moon covers the sun. And again, it has to be within a few degrees to count. And so most of the time, if you look at an ephemeris, you will find the day and time of an eclipse listed. And a good rule of thumb I use is if it's within about three degrees, uh, that you can figure that that eclipse is affecting that person. So for instance, do any of you know about, have any of you seen Donald Trump's chart? Okay, I have one more question. Um, yeah. Please comment on the moon as Lord of the 12th house in Jeffrey's chart. Okay, that's a very good question uh, because it is Lord of the 12th, which is the which is a um, not everything is totally perfect with his moon, uh, which is fine because it shouldn't be. Uh, nobody's, you know, this is not Lord Rama after all. You know, this is not the the perfect human. Uh, but as the Lord of the Twelfth, uh, it what that means is is that Cancer is the ruling sign for the Twelfth House, and you can really see that in the uh, if you look at the uh, North Indian chart, the Twelfth House here upper right four means Cancer. Over here we see that Cancer is always here. And the moon would rule Cancer, rule the 12th. So what you get there is you get the, the 12th Lord is in the 10th. And so this is somebody who can take experiences from those 12th house things and express them in his career. And he kind of did that. And as I say, like with the Lebowski, he, you know, in a comedian, a comedic sort of parody way, he was, he was sort of showing what, you know, what a Buddhist point of view is. He's actually is a practicing Buddhist. Notice that the 12th house is, gets a lot of benefit from having Venus and Jupiter opposite in the sixth house. So he's got a pretty good 12th house. You know, he can meditate. He can take some of these, you know, some of these insights, which, People would, you know, the conventional business would consider oddball like Starman or Lebowski, and you know, make them into make them into hit movies. Okay, uh, he apparently has a very quiet home life. He doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't go out much. You know, he's uh, he likes having that retreat. 
you know, and also you see the connection with the ocean there. He's always lived close to the ocean. Okay, one more question. Um, hello, Lynn, I have a question. If Moon has no enemies, could Moon in Capricorn or Aquarius, Saturn's dom domain, really be that bad as we are made to believe? Well, Moon in in uh, Capricorn or Aquarius uh, is, uh, it, well, it's actually its worst place is Scorpio because that's its debilitation sign. It has a lot of trouble with Scorpio. Okay, Moon in Scorpio has you know that's where the tales of woe are more likely and that you know a lot of emotional support is needed to just in a lot of work to maintain stability moon and capricorn and aquarius is um yeah it's quieter takes a more serious approach takes a more longer approach but uh doesn't you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be bad. It depends on uh, the, the sign it's in, what are the aspects, all of those other ways it's affected. So, uh, and again, then we look at the um, nakshatras because Capricorn has five, Capricorn and Aquarius have some wonderful nakshatras. We'll start with the first one in Capricorn, Uttarashada, which is near the Milky Way, center of the Milky Way galaxy and has a real universal outlook the star man you might say then we get to shravana in the middle of capricorn the listening ear the one is good at learning about ancient uh traditions good at languages uh they say that they like to endow temples because they have a practical focus and they work hard but then they they value spirituality then we have shada bishak the hundred stars the hundred physicians at the end of capricorn early aquarius uh, that wants to be a healer that's related to, you know, takes takes the difficult things and heals them. And then we've got, um, uh, after that, we've got um, Purva Bhadrapada at the end of Aquarius, uh, first part of Pisces, who is related to the dragon of the deep, um, the serpent. And uh, all of these are very deep signs, you know, the uh, nakshatra. So, so what we see with Moon and Capricorn Aquarius is is not necessarily that things are bad, but that uh, a person has a different outlook. They're, you know, they're not living on the surface. Okay. The next question: um, Can you talk about void of course Moon? Does Vedic astrology accept void of course moon where any action taking the void of course moon will be nullified well uh that's actually an advanced topic that uh, muhurta and prashna uh, those sorts of questions are covered in the advanced courses in the 200 series uh you really have to have a, a great foundation in the basics then uh, i would say that they're uh it's important when you're looking at a very specific question. Uh, and just like uh, traditional Western astrology, for instance, from the medieval and Hellenistic, where you know they're, they're, there's a lot of similarities there. And that is one thing that uh, can be taken into account, but also just as important in Prashna is what is going on with the Lagna. Uh, which is uh, what is going on with the lugna? Is the lugna getting near the end of something or the beginning of something? If you ask an astrologer a question and the rising sign degree is 29 degrees of something, um, you know, the, the astrologer has to say, now, wait a minute, you know, whatever is going on, we're kind of too late to deal with it. Okay, so it's only one of many things that would go into looking at uh, looking at uh, what we call Prussian or reading uh, a horary question. Next question. And would you say Moon is the higher octave of Venus? Hmm. You know, that's actually not, that's a vocabulary that comes out of Western astrology. Uh, and so, so it's kind of, um, it's kind of a little more difficult to translate. We'll just say that in Vedic astrology, um, 
the both moon and Venus are feminine grahas or planets. Uh, the the moon having to do is is a luminary. It's on the parallel with the sun, the the father, the mother, the um, uh, uh, Purusha Prakriti. Uh, the um, but whereas Venus is one of the five visible grah, the Tara grahas, the the visible planets, and has this connection with um, with beauty with uh, with uh, with the endocrine system with sex with uh, with uh, love with all of the things that make our social connections including uh, you know when we trade when you know with what we value and so forth so so uh, but but uh, the higher that octave concept really is a Western concept it's not a Vedic one Next question. Um, also, film industry is 12. Uh, excuse me? Also, film industry is 12th. Is it in the 12th house, maybe, they're asking that? Well, uh, not, you know, not necessarily. Uh, it, it, it could be, but it's, you'll see many aspects of film industry in many different uh, babas. So, uh, so I wouldn't look there specifically, but I look for for the use of the imagination that in in uh, in Burgess chart that he could bring that imagination in. We're kind of getting near the end of the time uh, here. Uh, uh, I just want to see is there anybody who has any questions about uh, the college? I'll just um, say I think. I'm checking the questions. I think that was the last question we got. Um, I think we are good to go with that. Yeah. Well, what I'll say is that I think what's what's unique about our program is that it uh, you can start at any time, and because you have an individual tutor, uh, you and you're working on your own schedule, uh, you have the potential to get through a lot of material. Uh, the uh, and also we have a very organized system so you you know you you build on the foundation of what you started with and then you get to the next one and the next one and uh, if you uh, want to not just learn about astrology but actually read charts this is the place for you uh, you won't get there quickly it uh, takes uh, takes many months to be and put in some time and effort uh, but uh, and it's not for everybody, but if you've got, if if it seems to mean something for you, uh, it's worth exploring and you can email questions to the registrar. Okay, um, Sarah said do more webinars like this. Excuse me? Do more webinars like this. Do more than someone, someone said do more webinars. Um, they want to okay uh, to hear more. Yeah. Okay, yes. Well, we have a webinar once a month, and uh, the next one in April, I believe, that uh, is going to be Jody Debbie Devi with uh, Charlotte uh, Benson. She will take questions, and uh, there will we're in the process of. Uh, of uh, revitalizing our program and we also have wonderful news to share with you which is that um, in November the Sedona conference is going to happen according to Dennis Harness and this last year it was all online I have not been told the exact dates I haven't been told the format whether it's in person or online but it is a go uh, and we're um, I'm already thinking about uh, thinking about um, you know how many travel stores between here and uh, Sedona. <laughs> I love going to Sedona. All right, are we all set to um, go? All right. So, uh, is there I'm going any more questions? There's no more questions. Okay. What I'm going to do on my screen, I'm going to put up. Uh, uh, put up Ganesh and we'll say a, a closing mantra. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namodachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 
Hare Om Shri Gurupyo Namaha Hare Om. Hey, thank you.